So this evening then we're going to speak on the subject of the praise psalms. There's a small group of psalms within the Psalter itself. Of course, every psalm is a psalm of praise because the Hebrew title for the book, Tehillim, means praises. But here we get into the concept behind the book, the whole Psalter as it were, the prophetic purpose of the book of Psalms, which is to move the hearer from the invitation in Psalm 1 to be obedient to the call, the invitation of God, to Psalm 150, where everything that has breath will praise our Heavenly Father. And so you move them from the point of the invitation in Psalm 1 through all the Psalms till you get to that point at the end of the book of Psalms in Psalm 150, where literally, prophetically, everything gives praise to our Heavenly Father. And what it's typing out for us, brethren and sisters, is this. A continual life of praise, such as our Lord and Master modeled for us. Read these words in Psalm 40. And they put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in Yahweh. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That's Psalm 40, verses 3 and verse 7. The scholars have identified this group of praise psalms as being the second largest category behind laments within the Psalter. But the psalms can be broken down in a number of ways. And here's three examples of it in the first slide. By genre, so lament, trust, thanksgiving and praise, and we're going to look at praise. By theme, wisdom, creation, Zion, imprecatory, royal and enthronement. By author, David, the sons of Korah, Asaph, Solomon, Moses, and the, there are others. Today we're only interested in the first category, that's of genre, which is a literary term. You'll recognise it from the world of novels, for example. We have crime novels and romance novels and so forth. It simply means a category. So the Psalms themselves are a genre of literature, but the praise Psalms within the Book of Psalms are a sub-genre of the larger group. Now, having been a librarian in a previous life, I could get wildly excited and really boring on this idea of, on this theme of categorization, but I shall refrain myself. I only want to say this. The reason we mention it at all is that the largest group of Psalms within the Psalter is the laments. Depending on whose work you look at, there's between 57 and 65. So over a third of the book of Psalms is what known as laments. And one of the key purposes behind the laments are to help you and I to properly process our negative emotions, to deal with our pain, our confusion, our loss, our suffering after a godly manner. Therefore, what is true of the laments is also true of the other categories of Psalms, the Psalms of confidence and trust, the Psalms of thanksgiving, and the Psalms of praise. All of these different genres then of the Psalms are given to teach you and I how to regulate our emotions after the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Psalms then in part are a toolkit for us to learn how to bring our emotions into the subjection of the Word of God so that we bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. Can I have the next slide, please? So, this is modelled on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But there's also a hierarchy of Psalms, with praise at the top, when all in your life is well, and you're able to praise God, unfettered. But then as you come down to the bottom, you have laments. And as you cycle through the laments and you're dealing with your pain and your loss and your suffering and those things that happen to us that knock the wind out of us, you might get to the point where you can move straight to praise. But often you can't. Sometimes you can move to thanksgiving because God interacts and brings you deliverance. Sometimes you're still waiting for deliverance, but you've built that confidence and trust. So you can cycle to those psalms. On one occasion in Psalm 88, you have to just keep lamenting because there's no hope in that psalm, apart from the fact that the psalmist 
is putting his hope in God. But eventually you will cycle through the forms and come back to praise where all is well. So the book of Psalms then suggests to us, describes a movement or a journey. We know itself that the book is divided into five smaller books. And the first three of these are where the majority of the laments occur. Then in books four and five, praise becomes the dominant, dominant genre within the book of Psalms. Now this actually corresponds to Israel's history. In the lowest point in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 88, as I've said a moment ago, there's no hope in it. It's found at the tail end of book three. The last Psalm in book three is Psalm 89, where God intervenes at the end of the Davidic kingdom with the failure of the Davidic line of kings to show that he will bring a king, he will provide a righteous king that will restore the nation's fortunes because of his covenant faithfulness. So then in books four and five of the Psalms, it steadily climbs back up. Thanks for putting that in there, Tim. It steadily climbs back up the mountain from that low point all the way back up till you get to that great crescendo of praise in Psalms 146 to 50. Well, the Messianic hope is fulfilled. It imagines then the outworking of God's covenant faithfulness prophetically achieved in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the whole structure then of the book of Psalms, brothers and sisters, follows this linear journey down through the valley of the shadow of death, then up the steep ravine on the other side through the failed Davidic kingdom to the establishment of the kingdom under Christ and the saints. Fascinatingly enough, though, even individual Psalms follow the same trajectory. I've just hinted at one and using the language from Psalm 23. But also Psalm 119 follows this exact pattern. Now what is depicted there in the journey of Israel through its history also has its counterpart in our experience as our Heavenly Father in his providence breaks down our characters and rebuilds them to conform to the likeness of his Son. So you and I, brothers and sisters, are also on a journey to the maturing of our faith. And regardless of our physical circumstances, our inner man is being renewed day by day, as with the eye of faith we can see more clearly that perfect day approaching. Therefore, just as we see within the Psalter, praise ought to be more common in our experience as we mature in Christ Jesus. For our Heavenly Father desires for each one of us to have a strong finish, brothers and sisters. We read in Psalm 34 these words, I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in Yahweh. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me. Let us exalt his name together. And we desire to do this, even in times of great distress, and pain and in difficult circumstances because we can see the end goal. What's fascinating here with all these praise psalms is though they call and invite us to praise our Heavenly Father, that praise can only be partially fulfilled in history in the past or in the here and now, whilst that ha they hearken back to all that God is and everything that God has done in creation and for his people, both natural Israel and spiritual Israel. They're only truly realized in the age to come. And this brings you and I comfort because at times in life, you and I don't feel like praising God. The circumstances of life are such where that's one of the hardest things that we're called upon to do. But the comfort comes in this because the praise here is pointing forward to something yet to be fulfilled. It means we can praise our Heavenly Father, even when life is not good. Because we know in that, we're not being hypocritical. But like the book itself, these Psalms then are prophetic of what shall shortly come to pass. So they bolster our faith and our hope as we look at the partial fulfillment in the past of these Psalms, 
and our Heavenly Father's continued unfolding of his purpose in the present. The overflow of our faith enables us to lift up God, to place our confidence and our trust in him and his provision for us in Christ Jesus. Can we have the next slide, please? So moving on into the hymns of praise, these two can be further divided into two groupings, general hymns and creation hymns. These are just a sample set, but not every one in each of these class. Praise hymns, therefore, brothers and sisters, are for communal worship. They were composed for that purpose, to develop and strengthen the ecclesia's faith. As we read elsewhere, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. Now, unlike the other three main genres of psalms, lament, trust and thanksgiving, we all come, they all come in initial response to some situation of a, or event. Whereas the praise psalms, on the other hand, are a response to the person and the character of God and how he's perceived in redemptive history and in creation. Their main purpose is to describe Almighty God to all who will listen. These psalms powerfully provide testimony and witness to our Heavenly Father that draw others to him from the words of the psalmist, both within the community of faith, but also from without. So although the focus is upon our Heavenly Father, the psalm has two audiences, a God whom it praises, but also the faithful, encouraging their worship, their trust, and their witness for God. If you move on to the next slide, please. Here we have the structure of a hymn of praise. It's basically broken into three parts. There is an initial call to praise. Then comes the main body of the psalm, giving the reasons that we're called to praise our Heavenly Father for. And then finally, there is a repeated call to praise or some strong statement of confidence and trust in God. Can we move to the next psalm, please? Next, sorry, next slide. Thank you. Turn with me to Psalm 117. He is a very, very short psalm. Two verses. It's a hymn of praise. This is the one we're going to look at just briefly, brothers and sisters. To see the three-part structure, you can see it here. The first verse has the call to praise. Then the, the second verse has the other two parts. Let me read the psalm for you. Oh, praise Yahweh, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of Yahweh endureth forever. Praise ye Yah, or hallelujah, as we could say. So we have a call to praise, then the reasons given for praise. There are two reasons in this psalm, and then a, re a repetitive call to praise. So verse 1 holds for us this call. Then the other two parts, we see the other two sections of this hymn of praise. The two reasons given. The main body of the hymn is in the reasons given. God wants to for you and I to focus in on the reasons. God doesn't just call upon us to praise. He gives us the reasons why we should praise him. He provides us with the evidence. That's usually intimated by the words for or because, but it's not always the case. So verse 2 then introduces the two reasons for us, bringing before us the marvellous character of our Heavenly Father. Psalm 117 focuses in, it zeroes in on the twin beauties of his merciful kindness and on his truth or his faithfulness, which we read endure forever. These are the characteristics that we are called upon by the psalmist through the spirit to stop, to meditate upon, to pause, to consider. The psalmist is beckoning you and I, like a hill walker on the top of one of those hills that we saw in that slide earlier who comes across a, a vista that's awe-inspiring and breathtaking, right? And the rest of the party is bringing up the rear, and he's waving them, come and see this, come and see this. That's the picture that's been painted here. The psalmist is saying to you and I, come and see what I can see concerning the character of our God. And he brings before us the merciful kindness, the hesed of God, 
that wonderful central characteristic of our Heavenly Father. And we're told it is great here. Now here's the point that I want to make. The sense of that word great here is to prevail utterly, to overcome all resistance. So the merciful kindness of God will overcome all resistance in its path. Think about this in the terms of these words from the book of Philippians. Being confident of this very thing, that he had, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe this is just me. But as we get closer to the return of the Master, brothers and sisters, I'm more conscious of just how much I still need to change and develop. I'm only too aware of how little time there is. So this idea of a Heavenly Father's prevailing, merciful kindness is of immense consolation to me. It's interesting that that phrase, merciful kindness, is only found in one other place. It's in these words in Psalm 119. Let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word, unto thy servant. Isn't that so wonderfully apt? We can think of this also in the context of someone like Lot. Think about it. Who dithered and lingered in Sodom until the angels literally took him and his family by the hand, and drew him out of that wicked place. A heavenly father's loyal love, his covenant faithfulness, is able to prevail over all our resistance, brothers and sisters. And then his truth, his faithfulness, which is the other characteristic that's highlighted here in these verses. That our heavenly father is totally reliable, That he is firm, dependable, faithful to his covenant promises. This should also wonderfully bring us comfort, brothers and sisters. But if you come back to the first verse, and in the call to praise that's initially given here by the psalmist, Oh, praise Yahweh, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. We observe that in these hymns of praise, The call is usually in the imperative mood. In other words, it's a direct command from our Heavenly Father through the psalmist. The psalmist is calling upon the nations to make their boast, put their confidence, put their trust, as the word praise here means, in the God of Israel. Why? Because Psalm 98 shows us for his covenant faithfulness in redeeming his people Israel. This command reason pattern is important and introduces us to a wonderful truth. Coming back to the idea I mentioned earlier of bringing our emotions into captivity to the word of God. For this is a command to give praise and such praise is to be not half-hearted but fully engaged in with the heart, enthusiastic, celebratory, joyful. The scriptures demand that we praise God with gladness. In fact, one of the reasons that Israel were thrown out of the land is because they didn't serve with joy. Now, the scriptures make an important distinction between our feelings and our emotions, brothers and sisters. Our feelings come to us completely unbidden by our flesh as a result of whatever stimuli you are receiving at the time in life whereas our emotions are your heart engaged response to those feelings in our words your heart chooses how it will respond in one situation you may become completely angry in another situation you may just engage your patience Now, we may have no control over what we initially feel, but our emotions, we always have a choice over, that they may be brought into captivity to the gospel. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 4. And we shall see an example of this. In Genesis chapter 4, we read these words. Let me turn it up. Genesis 4 and verses 5 and 7. 
But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And Yahweh said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin life at the door. And unto thee shall his desire be, and thou shalt rule over him. See how here our Heavenly Father challenges Cain over his emotion of great anger, that if left uncorrected, would lead him into sin. And sadly, in this case, this is exactly what happened. And he rose up and murdered his brother Abel. This is why the Proverbs instruct us to keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That's Proverbs 4 and verse 23. So our Heavenly Father, here in the first verse of Psalm 117, commands our praise because he desires to engage directly with our hearts and our emotions in a godly manner for our eternal good. Brothers and sisters, praise is a choice. It's not a feeling. We are called upon to praise our Heavenly Father. It is our responsibility, our duty. It should be our delight. Our God does not need our praise. But we need it for what it does for us. That in itself is a blessing from our gracious God. We read this in Psalm 33 in verse 1. Rejoice in Yahweh, O you righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. It is only right and proper that we praise God for who he is and what he does. By paradox, if praise were a feeling, I suspect that many of us would rather feel like We'd really feel like praising God if we were totally honest. But because it's a choice, we can praise. And when we do praise, often the feeling actually comes with it. The joy, the gladness, as a result of doing so. So, brothers and sisters, we've explored the first two parts of the structure of a praise hymn. The invitation, the call, the command to praise. And then the reason for the main body of this idea of praising our God. Which shows that, the, that our praise is engaging our Heavenly Father's work, not just with the heart and the emotions, but also with the mind, because he gives us sufficient and abundant reasons to praise him. Why does he do so in poetry? Well, because poetry engages multiple layers in your brain, on both sides of your brain. It taps into your emotions and your heart as well. Stories may move you and I emotionally, but poetry in particular stills us, causes us to pause because of the nature of the language, because of the terseness of the language, to slow us down, to patiently take it in in order to understand it. For although it requires effort and the activity is well worth it, for the vistas, imagine that being on the mountainside again, the vistas that the poetry reveals to us are so awe-inspiring that the effort is more than worth it, brothers and sisters. Think about that, what we saw earlier, with the prevailing masterful kindness of our Heavenly Father. Finally then, there is at the end of the second verse within Psalm 117, the repeated call to praise, which is the final part of a hymn of praise of the structure of it. Here in the form of that familiar refrain, praise ye Yah, or hallelujah. Sometimes we find the psalmist through the spirit repeats the initial phrase of a psalm at the end of the book. It's what's called an inclusia or an envelope structure. So Psalm 146 to 150 has that hallelujah refrain. But in Psalm 136, for example, we have this, oh, give thanks unto Yahweh for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. In the first verse, and then we have it repeated in the final verse, verse 26. The only difference is, instead of Yahweh, it has the God of heaven. So the title of God is different there, and it's something for you to take away and potentially meditate upon. Now that is the case. So this repeated encouragement to praise ends the psalm, bringing the movement of the psalm full circle, implying that praise to our Heavenly Father is not a once-and-done affair. Rather, it's an ongoing, continual practice, such as we see in the book of Revelation. Read this in Revelation 4 and verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them 
six wings about them. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. If we tie that in with First Chronicles 9 and verse 33, where we read, And these are the singers, the chief of the fathers of the Levites, who remain in the chambers, were three, for they were employed in that work of singing day and night. And such will it be as we knew in the temple of the age to come, brothers and sisters. What we see there in those pictures of the glorified saints at worship in the book of Revelation is that you and I were created to give praise and to worship our Heavenly Father. But the sad fact of our current predicament due to our defiled nature is we seek to praise and worship all the wrong things and in all the wrong places. We settle for cheap imitations and substitutes. We have this quote here from C.S. Lewis. If we consider the un blushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We have heart-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. I find the end of that so quintessentially English, the idea of the offer of a holiday at the seaside. But it captures the point. But let me give you one more feature of the language from the psalm that is very, very interesting without trying to get too technical. In Psalm 117, there is a switch in the pronouns from verse 1, which uses the second person, and then it switches to the third person in verse 2. And the idea behind this, in the first verse, is to draw the psalmist personally first, closer to God, as he then calls in verse 2 to draw others personally to God. So you have this movement back and forth within the psalms between the second and the third person. This is important because the psalmist is exhorting himself before he's able to encourage others. And we need to acknowledge, brothers and sisters, that we too need this encouragement. We need to, when we read, slow down. Pay attention to the pronouns. If necessary, read less, but gain more in edification. You see, as it switches to the third person in verse 2, the psalmist is now powerfully witnessing to others to draw them to worship. And the beauty of Psalm 117 is he's not calling on his countrymen to worship God. He's calling on the Gentiles to worship God, and they are responding. For the psalm is wonderfully prophetic of Israel's millennial role, when finally the commission given in Exodus 19 and in Deuteronomy 24 is fulfilled by them as a nation under the direction of the saints. Read these words in Psalm 22 and verse 3. But thou art holy, O thou inhabitest the praises of Israel, and our Heavenly Father is enthroned then upon the praises of his people. He's to be enthroned, brothers and sisters, upon our praises. Our lives are to be like that of the Lord, to be one of praise, not just in the things that we speak, not just in the hymns that we sing, but in the lives that we lead. But we want to close out this consideration then of these hymns of praise by raising a couple of points out of Psalm 99. If you'd like to turn there, brothers and sisters. In Psalm 99, we have another one of these hymns of praise. It's also classified as a hymn of enthronement as well. It comes at the end of a, a line from Psalms 93 to Psalm 100, which all depict the kingdom beautifully. It presents our Heavenly Father as truly sovereign over the earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ at the commencement of the millennium. Yahweh reigneth. Let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. Yahweh is great in Zion. He is high above all people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. Firstly, the psalm then presents our Heavenly Father as holy because his holiness is to be exalted. 
Some three times the spirit for the psalmist draws our attention in verses 3, 5 and 9 to the holiness of God. This repeated exhortation and refrain is extended each time and explained further. We want to draw this out, brothers and sisters, because holiness is meant to be celebrated by us. Is this something that we do? Holiness is the one title attributed to our Heavenly Father more than any other within the Scriptures. It's the only characteristic of God that's spoken of thrice. Holy, 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 as we read earlier from Revelation or from Isaiah. <coughs> Excuse me. Taking it, therefore, to the superlative, superlative, I can't say the word now, superlative level, that's it, that's how you say the word. All of these praise hymns are designed and engendered to create within us a high and exalted view of our Heavenly Father. For his holiness, rather than push us away from him, brothers and sisters, because he is morally other to us, that is true, and morally distinct, distinct from us. His holiness is separate in that sense. But rather than push that, we, we being pushed away by it, this psalm shows powerfully that we sh it should actually draw us in. It's the supreme moral inspiration for all those who come to acknowledge him, who wish to follow his son, to be drawn into the holiness of God. If you look at the final verses of this psalm, Psalm 99 and verses 69, we read these words. Moses, Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name, they called upon Yahweh and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Yahweh our God. There was a God that forgave us them, though thou took us vengeance of their inventions. Exalt Yahweh our God and worship at his holy hill, for Yahweh our God is holy. God brings forth three witnesses and the persons of Moses, Samuel, and Aaron, to show his interaction with his people in the past, to provide you and I with confidence in the present and for the future. He answered their prayers. He forgave their sins. He took vengeance on their inventions. The best rendering of that really is he allowed the consequences of their sin to run out so that they would learn from those experiences and be drawn towards his holiness further. You see, God's holiness, when encountered by his people, causes them to replicate it and thereby exalt God in that process. Therefore, comfortingly, the grace of God is not in opposition to his holiness, but in service to it. So our Heavenly Father and the work of his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will drive the sin out of you and I, brothers and sisters, by that holiness, through you and I becoming more holy, through the process of God manifestation. In conclusion then, these wonderful Psalms, brothers and sisters, portray to us the great character of our God, the great faithfulness of our God, that he's able to fulfill all that he has promised to us. And through our understanding of these hymns of praise, we can exalt and rest in that beautiful character. And we can with David then cry to one another, oh, magnify Yahweh with me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.